Tanakoto Katoa. It is truly lovely to see the continued growth in numbers attending these webinars, although it's no surprise given the quality of these speakers. Tonight was no exception as we're joined by Kate. Kate is an obstetrics and gynaecology consultant and a senior lecturer at the University of Otago in women's health. Kate works as a generalist obstetrician and gynaecologist at Southland Hospital in Vicargill and at the University of Dunedin. Kate has recently hit stuff.co.nz with her amazing achievements, which include completing a PhD in England while training in Australia, plus the two previous mentioned jobs and raising three children. Tonight, Kate's presentation will include miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy and molar pregnancies. As I say, feel free to introduce yourself on the chat function and any questions you have along the way, if you list them in the Q&A tab, we can ask them to Kate as we go. And I shall now hand you over to Kate. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. It's a bit disconcerting giving a webinar because you can see me, but I can't see any of you. Um, so I'm Kate Coffey. And um, I am a senior lecturer at the University of Otago 0.5 FTE in Southland um, Hospital in Invercargill. And um, the first slide that I wanted to start with is just um, one of my family. Um, the, the article in stuff.co.nz recently was actually just for the Southland Times. That's what it was sold to me as. And then uh, it was put on the national news website. So I didn't expect it to have such wide circulation. Um, I thought that the uh, journalist did a lovely article, but I didn't really like the title, which was something along the lines of, you know, mum, doctor, uh, scientist, how can she do it all? And um, no one can do it all. <laughs> um, and But the reason that I can do what I, what I do do is because I have my mother who's here, Marilyn, and she um, looks after my children a lot, um, particularly on the days that I'm in Invercargill. And um, her good friend Maureen is standing next to her here and she um, helps out on a Wednesday and picks one of my kids up from her extension program. And my husband, Sean, is a cardiologist in Dunedin and is the solo parent on Thursdays and Fridays when I'm in Invercargill. And um, then my three children are here, Oscar, uh, Kira and Ashling. Um, you'll hear from my accent that I'm not a native Kiwi. I was born in Canada and I did my medical education in the UK. So uh, medical school at St. George's in London. And then we did house jobs uh, pretty much all over the country, actually. So we did our house jobs in Bristol and then moved to Newcastle. And um, I worked in Newcastle and in Sunderland. Uh, so we've been all over the show. And then we came to New Zealand for our OE for one year. And here we are. Uh, 13 years later. So I'm sure there are many others in the audience who have a similar story. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about early pregnancy problems um, and this is where they start. <laughs> um, uh, pregnancies with good outcomes, pregnancies with bad outcomes, uncertain pregnancies, wanted, unwanted, they generally start with a urine pregnancy test um, to confirm them. And um, these urine pregnancy tests have radically changed pregnancy care and women's experience of pregnancy because you can literally conceive on day 14 of your cycle and find out by about 10 days post ovulation with the new very sensitive pregnancy tests that a conception has occurred and that is such a massive change from how things were um, even 15 20 years ago um, but certainly 20 30 40 years ago uh, when confirming pregnancy usually involved some mammal or amphibian dying for you to, to get that information. Um, so people find that really, and um, women who are trying to conceive tests in the days leading up to their expected menstrual period in order to confirm as soon as possible whether they've successfully conceived. Um, so these new high sensitivity urine HCG assays, these are the, obviously this is a domestic one. Um, the ones that we use in our surgeries are very similar. They work along the same lines, but they're those little white cassettes that you put the urine in one end and it travels up. Um, and the thing to know about them is that they will bring a, a positive result, um, certainly by the first, um, the day of the missed period, but often three or four days earlier. Um, and we're going to talk in a couple of slides about why that's important information for us as healthcare practitioners to, to know. Um, so these new assays will detect 
as little as um, some of them can detect six milli international units of HCG, um, which is an incredibly low amount. So um, a lab serum positive is either over two or over five milli international units. So a, the most sensitive urine pregnancy tests can really are pretty much as sensitive as a serum test nowadays. Um, and certainly when I was in my teen years doing pregnancy tests on myself, uh, they would only detect a level of 50 or 100 um, international units. And if you think about the doubling of HCG um, in early pregnancy, that really is a significantly delayed diagnosis, even only 10 years ago compared to now. Um, so I, I'm starting my talk with HCG and ultrasound because they're really the most important tools in early pregnancy care in the modern era. Um, we tend to um, have really good access to ultrasound in tertiary units and in gynecology, um, places that have gynecology. Uh, I know that in rural places, the access um, of ultrasound is really different and that can modify how you um, provide early pregnancy care. Um, but the gold standard for early pregnancy care is to have an H a, a serum HCG um, level, so a quantitative HCG, and a transvaginal ultrasound scan to help us diagnose what's going on. And I've put this is not, none of the ultrasound images are my own. I've got to work on acquiring some to use for talks. Um, but this is a, an ultrasound image from the internet. And it's really just to show you why transvaginal ultrasound scans are the gold standard um, for, for all gynecology really, but especially for early pregnancy, when what we're looking for is often um, a fetal pole that might be two, three, four, five millimeters in length. And so this image shows you what we see transabdominally in a pretty slim woman. This is a good transabdominal image. And you can see that the abdominal wall, which is up here is really thin. So you depend on having a full bladder to create a window. And you can see the uterus, um, the cervix is just here and the vagina is here. Um, but this is the same woman with a transvaginal probe. And what you can see is just that you get so much more detail. This is not a pregnancy ultrasound scan. This is just a gynecological one. Um, but you can see the endometrium. You get, um, I mean, that massive thickness of endometrium compared to this. All right, so the definition is just incredibly better. The other thing to think about is the BMI of the woman. Um, and so transabdominal scanning can be really hampered if you've got a woman with a higher BMI. Um, there's obviously more maternal tissue to get through. And um, nobody has a lot of fat in their vagina. So transvaginal scanning um, can give you really equivalent images in someone with a BMI of 40 or 50 um, as it can in someone who's um, very slim. So that's the reason for asking for transvaginal scans. Um, when you refer someone for an early pregnancy ultrasound, in general, the sonographers will want to do a transvaginal scan and that's usually what they'll offer the women. So you don't usually have to specify that that's what you're after. But as someone who may know the patient and might be the first person to talk to them about getting a scan, it can be really helpful if you have the chance to mention that the sonographers may wish to do a transvaginal scan and to mention the reasons for it, which is that the image quality is much better and they'll get a much better view of the pregnancy um, by passing their, a, a small, a slim probe into the vagina. Um, the other thing that you can help prepare them for is the fact that the probe actually looks massive. Um, I, I'm not sure whether everyone has seen them, but they're about this long, um, but only a few centimeters actually pass into the vagina um, and they're much, slimmer, they're, they're slightly thicker than the average finger, um, but much slimmer than the average penis. So any woman who's sexually active should be able to comfortably um, have a transvaginal probe in her vagina. So I was going to start with a couple of slides about early pregnancy clinic. Um, I think there are quite a few nurses and nurse practitioners um, on this and shout out to whoever's here from Gore, um, I, I, if you're here, hello. Um, uh, we'll probably share patients or have shared patients um, in the past. So early pregnancy clinic is where we as gynecologists tend to interact with women with early pregnancy issues. And so we see a very selected and different population than people who are working in primary care. Um, 
Early pregnancy clinics are a model that originated um, in Europe and certainly in the UK. I'm not sure whether they originally came from any of the Scandinavian countries, which most uh, amazing things in medicine seem to originate in, public health things. Um, but early pregnancy clinics are designated clinics, usually nurse run, that give women rapid access um, to systematic follow-up, uh, specialized care, and um, quick intervention when required. Um, the one in Dunedin is run by a nurse who's there every day. She doesn't work full-time hours, but I think around eight till one or eight till two daily. Um, she's supported by uh, junior doctors who will come and see um, the patients, make uh, a rapid assessment and treatment plan and um, consent them for surgery if needed, perform bedside ultrasound scanning if they're competent to do so and the woman has um, something that is amenable to a bedside scan. And she also has dedicated scan slots every day that she can send um, the women to prior to them being seen by our team. And so those women have already been triaged to be accepted to the clinic. And they've also been assessed and cared for by people in the community who've often done a lot of the initial legwork in terms of figuring out what's wrong. So the people who generally come to see us in early pregnancy clinic um, are women with vaginal bleeding. That's definitely the most common presentation. Um, it's important to note that about 15 to 30 percent of women have bleeding in the first trimester, but only around half of those will have a failing pregnancy. So the flip side of that, as I always say to the medical students, is that when we speak to women on delivery suite and take a history from those coming in for induction or coming in with suspected preeclampsia or other problems, um, at least half of them will report having had some spotting or bleeding in the first trimester. Um, so vaginal bleeding in the first trimester is very common. It's always called a threatened miscarriage, but it only represents um, the, the starting of a pathway of miscarriage in around half of the women who present with that symptom. Um, once a woman's had a scan showing a viable intrauterine pregnancy, so a scan with a fetus in the uterus with a fetal heart seen, she has less than a 10% chance of losing that pregnancy, even if she's had some bleeding. So we can be pretty reassuring with women who have a scan showing a live intrauterine pregnancy. Um, early pregnancy patients can also be high risk patients. So women who've had a previous ectopic or recurrent miscarriages. And there's been basically one study that was done um, quite a long time ago now, at least 20 years ago, that showed that um, reassurance ultrasound scans, so regular weekly ultrasound scans in women with history of recurrent miscarriage, um, do seem to prevent recurrent loss in the scanned pregnancy. And no one knows why. We assume that it is because the women are less stressed they're visualizing the baby every week and um, getting good feedback that everything's going well, but we actually don't know why it is. Um, but that is a service that most early pregnancy clinics will offer. Um, and the other patients that might come to us would be people who are um, recognized as having medical problems, so maybe diabetes or something where they need early contact with ONG and they're not likely to get into an antenatal clinic quickly enough. Um, Suspected ectopic pregnancy is another bread and butter um, patient group for early pregnancy clinics. So that's women who have abdominal pain, um, plus or minus bleeding, without scan evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy or who haven't yet had a scan. Um, however, there are some women, especially in that latter category, who are not suitable for early pregnancy clinic. So anyone who's clinically unstable, so if you get someone who comes to you who is pale, they're tachycardic, or you think they might become tachycardic, they're super sore, they need um, high levels of analgesia, uh, you feel nervous about leaving them alone in a room, um, or they're bleeding heavily, or you think that they could have a ruptured ectopic, they're not, not patients who are suitable for early pregnancy clinic, they need to go straight to acute gynecology. Um, and I've also put on here, this, this talk, part, parts of this talk were originally written in 2010 um, for, um, the gynecology nurses uh, symposium that I speak at fairly regularly. Um, another thing is anyone who definitely needs admission probably is better to come through ED and through the gynecology registrar of the day because otherwise often the early pregnancy clinics are run by um, junior doctors who are not on acute gynecology and so they'll come in, they'll meet the nurse who may be a stable presence in their 
clinical course, but they'll meet a doctor who isn't actually the one who's going to be looking after them in hospital. And um, so that's just something to think about as well. So actually, we think that about 80% of conceptions end in miscarriage. All right, but most of those conceptions are never detected as a clinical pregnancy. And about 50% of chemical pregnancies, so chemical pregnancy is when you, when you pee on a stick really early on, about 50% of those could be lost. And then um, about 30% of pregnancies that make it a little bit further than that can be lost. Once you've had an ultrasound scan confirmed pregnancy, your chance of losing it is about 15%. So that's still relatively high. And once we've seen a fetal heart on ultrasound, that drops down to less than 10%. Um, unfortunately, miscarriage increases with age, and we'll um, see a little bit later on why that is. Um, but it also increases with the increasing number of miscarriages that you've already had. So a woman who's had one miscarriage is not considered to be at an increased risk in the next pregnancy compared to the rest of the population of having another miscarriage. But once you've had two or more miscarriages, then your risk of um, pregnancy loss with each subsequent pregnancy is raised compared to the, the rest of the population. Um, causes of miscarriage are pretty well known. Now we know that more than half of them are due to aneuploidy, so due to having the wrong number of chromosomes. Um, the trisomies, so um, Down syndrome, Edward syndrome, and um, Patau syndrome, and Turner syndrome, um, which is not a trisomy but a monosomy, are the most common causes of miscarriage. So, and that information comes from studies where they've taken the um, pregnancy tissue from lost pregnancies and done chromosomal analysis on them. And they found that more than half of them had the wrong number of chromosomes. Um, this is probably what accounts for most of the age-related pregnancy loss in women over 40. So um, one in 10 eggs in a woman over 40 is an aneuploid egg. So the ova that are sitting in her ovaries are more likely to be aneuploid, um, meaning that there's a 35 conceptions in women over 40 compared with two to three percent in women in their mid-20s. So that is a massive difference and I'm not sure it's something that is actually very well known in the general population. Everyone knows that you should try and conceive um, as, as young as socially, um, medically and financially possible but part of the reason for that is basically an unalterable fact about the genetics of the ova in women over 40. And that's why if you have ovum donation um, from a young woman and you put that pregnancy into an over 40 year old, actually her miscarriage risk is the same as the woman whose egg it was. So you don't, you don't carry your miscarriage risk because you're 40, it's because you've got 40 year olds eggs. Um, other much rarer causes of miscarriage would be anatomical causes like a uterine septum, polyps, fibroids, or adhesions, um, trauma, um, and recurrent miscarriage is um, defined as three consecutive miscarriages, generally within the same partnership. So it doesn't, it's not just someone who's had three miscarriages in their own life, but usually we would say with the same male partner. Um, having said that, I would say that certainly at a gynecology level, if we have someone who's um, over 35 and has had two consecutive miscarriages, or a woman who's um, in, you know, head, heading towards 40, um, we would have a very low threshold for doing recurrent miscarriage investigations in those women, mainly to reassure them because a massive percentage of the time, recurrent miscarriage investigations don't find any cause um, related to the woman or any genetic cause related to the two parents. Um, so you can then reassure people that although it's, um, it's not gonna help them deal with the losses they've already had, they don't carry anything that's likely to mean they're more likely to lose a further pregnancy um, and nothing modifiable. So um, uh, there's been a really big change to early pregnancy care and diagnosis of miscarriage in the last 10 years. And that's because of a couple of large studies that have been done that have affected our diagnosis of miscarriage. So we use the ASIM criteria for diagnosing miscarriage. And ASIM is the Australasian Society of Ultrasound and Medicine. And what we know from ASIM is that um, on a transvaginal ultrasound scan, 
in a woman with an intrauterine pregnancy, you should be able to see a gestation sac in a normal viable gestation at four weeks and three days from the last menstrual period. So very shortly after she's peed on a stick, um, but not straight away if it was positive at 10 days post ovulation, um, but just a few days after the missed period, if you did an ultrasound scan on a woman with a healthy viable intrauterine pregnancy, you'd be able to see a sac in the uterus. Okay, but a sac tells us that it's likely to be an intrauterine pregnancy. It doesn't tell us anything about viability. So the earliest th time that we can make an assessment of viability of the pregnancy, and so viability means aliveness, um, would be around five to six weeks from the LMP on a transvaginal scan. And that's when you can find a measurable fetal crown rump length. And usually um, the earliest that you can see it and measure it is at two millimeters. Um, but sometimes you can't see and measure it until um, a little bit larger than that. And usually you should, as soon as you can see a crown rump length, as soon as you can see the little line, I've got some pictures shortly, in the uterus um, with the, um, within the gestation sac, you usually can see the little flickering um, fetal heart. Um, so uh, if, if you get a scan report saying there's a measurable crown rump length, um, but fetal heart motion wasn't seen, generally speaking, that's probably not a good sign. Um, but they won't, they won't call it on one scan. Um, we'll see the, the rules on the next slide. So there was basically a large study done in the early 2000s that followed pregnancies and found that the ultrasound criteria that we used to use, which was a mean sac diameter, I think of 23 millimeters and a crown rump length of five or six millimeters, um, misdiagnosed some viable pregnancies and as non-viable. And that's just because like in much of medicine, there's actually quite a large um, spectrum of normality. So you can have a gestation sac um, up to 25 millimeters without being able to see a fetus in it that could still be normal in a day or two with a visible fetus. Um, so the cutoffs for diagnosing a failed pregnancy on, on a single scan are that you've got no live fetus visible in a gestation sac that's bigger than 25 millimeters, or you've got a fetus with a crown rump length of seven millimeters or greater, um, and the fetal heart movements can't be seen. And you have to watch for 30 seconds. And it has to be on a good quality transvaginal scan by an experienced operator. Okay, um, so what this means is that we quite often now see a scan report that says um, that there's a gestation sac of 23 millimeters with no fetal pole seen. We recommend rescanning in seven to 14 days in order to confirm viability. And um, some of those query viable pregnancies will turn out to be viable and many will turn out to be non-viable. So what it doesn't mean is that if you, when you get the next scan and it's still 23 millimeters, um, you, you are able to then diagnose a failed pregnancy, okay? So there should be growth of the sac and a visible um, fetus after seven to 14 days. And the seven to 14 days can feel quite mean. If you've got someone who knows that their last menstrual period was eight weeks ago, and you have a scan that shows that they're well behind their dates, they have a very regular cycle, they're certain of when conception occurred for social reasons, their partner was only in town that week, it, they can only be eight weeks pregnant. Um, it does often feel quite cruel to make them wait another seven to 14 days to have some closure and confirmation that the pregnancy is not ongoing. But um, this is the reason that these guidelines exist. So um, especially prior to the new guidelines, it was not infrequent and it always ends up in the newspaper, um, but women would be told that they had a failed pregnancy advised to have an evacuation or medical management and some of them would say no I'm not comfortable with that I want to wait somehow they would get another scan and they would find that they actually did have a viable pregnancy um, it also does happen with abortion um, from time to time that someone will have a termination and then um, it's failed and they're still pregnant so um, we just have to be very careful early pregnancy um, can be difficult to diagnose correctly um, and this is why <laughs> So um, this is a, a viable intrauterine pregnancy. So this is the uterine 
cavity here, the endometrial cavity, and the um, gestation sac. That's a fetal pole here, so you would measure a crown rump length on that. And um, this is the, the yolk sac. Sorry, fetal pole is there to there, and the yolk sac is here. Um, and so if you had a live scan, then you would see a, a little flickering fetal heart right in here. And this is an earlier pregnancy than that. So this is some, somewhere between that, um, that four weeks and three days when you can just see the, the gestation sac and, um, and the six weeks when you can see a fetal pole. And here, this is probably around five and a half weeks gestation. You've got the gestation sac here and you've got a yolk sac, which is a normal structure um, of pregnancy. And I don't know if you can all see that, but this is the outline of the uterus out here. And this is the endometrium that's nice and thickened. So it's a sort of um, paisley shape um, and it's nice and thick. And the pregnancy is in hand, implanted in a fundal region here. Okay, um, any questions so far, Kathleen? You all good? Okay, we hopefully. I've got one question at this point. And, it's, and they might cover this anyway, but how early should we do an ultrasound scan to exclude ectopic? So um, we, I, I'll probably go on to that in, the, in a further section. I'm actually not going to talk a lot about ectopic because I feel like that's an area that gets talked about a lot. Um, but um, I am going to cover it a little bit, so um, I'll remember to, to mention that. So miscarriage I find very confusing. Um, and I think part of the reason that the terminology is so confusing is that the terminology that we use comes from the olden days when we didn't have access to ultrasound scan and HCG so readily. So number one, um, most women wouldn't have had a confirmed pregnancy until they'd missed at least two periods. Um, getting a pregnancy test, as I said, would sometimes involve injecting the serum um, of a pregnant woman into a rabbit or a frog and then it being dissected in the lab. Um, they used to keep these breeding hatches of rabbits for these reasons in large hospitals and they would um, open them up and check what their ovaries looked like after injecting the pregnant, the query pregnant woman's blood into them. Um, so you didn't know you were pregnant until often you were eight to 12 weeks pregnant. Um, and what that meant was that the miscarriage rate was probably thought to be much lower than it is now because you didn't have these really early confirmed pregnancies that then never eventuated into a pregnancy that lasted long enough for you to figure out it was there. So a lot more pe people probably had a heavy late period back in the day. Um, and the diagnoses that we still use are based on, a, on clinical um, parameters, like many of the diagnoses that we use in medicine. Um, so I'm just going to go through the, the olden days terminology, and then on the next slide I've got sort of the more modern interpretations. So any bleeding in early pregnancy, once a pregnancy has been confirmed by peeing on a stick or a serum HCG, even spotting, is a threatened miscarriage. And um, in the past, a threatened miscarriage was one where you had bleeding but no passage of products of conception. The uterus was enlarged consistent with pregnancy but the cervical os, so the, the neck of the womb, was closed on digital examination. And um, you, so you could tell someone was pregnant but you, you didn't know what was going to happen, so threatened miscarriage. Um, an inevitable miscarriage was one where someone presented with bleeding, had not yet passed products of conception, but on bimanual examination, the cervical os was open. So that would have been confirmed by doing a digital vaginal examination and being able to pass your fingertip through the external os of the cervix, which is where we take pap smears from, and up through the internal os of the cervix. Now a caveat to that is that in a multiparous woman, so someone who's had vaginal births previously, sometimes that can be normal. Um, so you don't always know based on that examination that it's truly an inevitable miscarriage, but that's how they diagnosed them in, back in the day. Um, an incomplete miscarriage was where a woman presented with bleeding, having passed some pregnancy tissue, um, but she was still bleeding and you, you knew that there was still tissue in the uterus. And often that would have been because you could still see it protruding from the cervical os, but we're not able to remove it using sponge forceps. Or... Um, she had heavy enough bleeding that you took her to theater and found more tissue when you did a dilatation and curatage. Uh, a complete miscarriage 
was a clinical diagnosis where a woman presented with a history of heavy bleeding, having past products of conception, so she might say that she'd seen pregnancy tissue, sometimes she might bring, bring it in with her, or you might see someone who is in the process of having a miscarriage in ED and um, help her complete the miscarriage by removing products from the cervical os with sponge forceps. Um, and her bleeding stopped, her pain settled, and her uterus returned to a more normal size. And in a missed miscarriage, the woman had had no bleeding, no passes, passage of tissue, but she would have presented for care um, with a uterine size that was significant, significantly discrepant from her dates of pregnancy. Um, and in some cases, I believe they would have been diagnosed because someone would have come even at 20 weeks and say had a 12 week size uterus with no fetal heart tones. Um, so really that could be a very much delayed diagnosis in the past compared to um, when we tend to find it now. So now we use history, ultrasound, and beta HCG. Examination can still be useful, mainly because um, it allows assessment of how much bleeding someone's having, but also sometimes someone's having uh, is at the stage of an incomplete miscarriage or is actually complete and you can remove the products of conception from the upper vagina or from the cervix and um, the miscarriage process will be over for them, which will make them feel better um, and stop their bleeding. So modern miscarriage still threaten miscarriage is any PV bleeding, but generally we reassure ourselves with an ultrasound scan that the pregnancy is intrauterine and has a fetal heart present. Um, and so that's a threatened miscarriage. And I have seen some pretty spectacular threatened miscarriages. So whilst anything from spotting to frank bleeding is a threatened miscarriage, I have met women uh, in the ED in general who give a very good history for what I think is going to be a complete miscarriage. They say they've had bleeding heavier than a period, changing pads every few hours. Sometimes they've already had um, a hemoglobin done that's shown a drop of hemoglobin and they think they heard something plop into the toilet and I pop the scanner on thinking I'm going to be seeing an empty cavity and the whole gestation sac with a big waving baby is still in the uterus. So some women can actually bleed quite a lot and still be pregnant, which is just something that is important to know. Um, Women find it incredibly upsetting if they're told that they ha have definitely lost the pregnancy and they haven't. Um, so just be really careful um, to just say, look, any this bleeding is potentially serious. It's a threatened miscarriage because we know you're pregnant and you've had this bleeding, um, but we need a scan to see what's happening with the, with the pregnancy. Um, an incomplete pregnancy, often women have come in um, given a history that's consistent with miscarriage and then continued having pain and bleeding and they have an ultrasound scan showing there are still products of conception in the uterus. Um, we tend to regard above 15 to 25 millimeters of um, products as a significant amount, as in an amount that would necessitate medical or surgical management um, to empty the uterus, and less than 15 to 25, and I'm just being a bit cagey because I would generally use 25 millimeters um, as a cutoff depending on the woman's symptoms, but I have been at talks where people have said 15, um, and I don't think that's wrong. Um, it's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, but I'd say definitely, so if, if you're in the 15 to 25 range of someone's got a scan showing that, then give your local gynecology service a ring and discuss the woman. Um, and they'll either say to watch and wait for a little while, consider antibiotics, or that they would like to see her to consider an evacuation. Um, complete hasn't really changed, except that we can now get a, an ultrasound picture showing us a nice empty uterine cavity, which is very reassuring um, in terms of the woman not needing any further management medically. Um, and a missed miscarriage is now... Um, I mean, I'm sure it was always a tragic diagnosis, especially if you got quite far into pregnancy and found that the pregnancy was non-viable. But I think that um, we all must feel very empathic for the woman who goes along for her um, dating scan or a 12-week scan, very excited to be seeing her baby, often with a partner or other family members, and gets a diagnosis that there's no fetal heart and that the intrauterine pregnancy the, um, is not viable. Um, so that's by far the commonest way that we find this miscarriage these days is um, when they've gone for a routine scan and found to not have an ongoing pregnancy. Um, so the management of miscarriage in the past was always surgical. So either women came in having a miscarriage 
um, and could be managed conservatively because they completed their miscarriage or they never actually got to secondary care um, at all. Or um, with referral to secondary care, traditionally a DNC was performed, so a dilatation and curatage, which we now tend to call an evacuation of retained products of conception or an e ERPOC. Um, and, and there are some advantages of surgical management, especially with modern lifestyles. So um, if you have a diagnosis of a, of a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy and you've had some bleeding, and you do any of the jobs that all of us are in, or you're a teacher, or you have got three active um, toddlers at home, um, then actually waiting for nature to take care of a miscarriage can be very suboptimal. So um, if you opt for conservative management, it can take anywhere up to four to six weeks for um, the pregnancy to pass fully. Um, you can have relatively substantial bleeding, quite a bit of pain. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty for women. They don't know when it's going to happen. Um, they don't know where they're going to be. They don't know if they're going to be standing up in front of their kindy class and bleed through their trousers. Um, so uh, surgical management, I'd say the main um, benefit to surgical management is that it can be timed and uh, it, it's over uh, relatively quickly in a predictable fashion with a general anesthetic. Um, there is some post-operative pain, but it's not painful at the time and in general um, one evacuation is all that's needed so um, it is possible to miss some of the pregnancy tissue uh, but usually the evacuation is done completely uh, the tissue can be sent for histology so we can exclude um, molar pregnancy exclude an ectopic so if you um, do a dnc on someone and you don't get any chorionic villi or any pregnancy tissue you have to be mindful that it could be an ectopic pregnancy that you've missed um, or you can, you can miss the pregnancy if it's very early um, or if the woman has something like a bicornuate uterus. Um, so a friend of mine, we had a woman who was from somewhere relatively rural near Dunstan, I think, and she was 14 weeks pregnant and had had a diagnosis of a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy of about 12 weeks size. And she came in for an evacuation of retained products of conception, which was uneventful. And um, the practitioner performing the procedure was a very experienced registrar who saw pregnancy tissue passing into the suction. And um, three days later, that woman phoned the prime nurse and was having heavy bleeding and severe pain. And when the prime nurse attended with an ambulance, the woman had passed a 12 week pregnancy at home. And when we got the histology back from the evacuation, there was no pregnancy tissue in the histology. And um, it turned out that the woman had a bicornuate uterus. So she had um, a side of the uterus that had the pregnancy in it and another side of the uterus that had thickened endometrium, which is what the person doing the procedure had sucked out. And um, so it's definitely possible, even good hands. I know the person who did the procedure and she's an excellent doctor and um, to miss the pregnancy. So if you can imagine something, it can happen. Um, so, um, ERPOC is something that is offered in most hospitals. It's not offered in the community um, anywhere that I know of. Um, you can have a surgical evacuation done under local anesthetic in an, uh, an early pregnancy clinic setting in Christchurch. So they use something called a manual vacuum aspirator, an MVAC, um, but that's not in, uh, offered in the southern region where I work. Um, and it's, the, it's not offered in, in many places. Um, that I know of, um, but that can be a good uh, halfway house so the woman doesn't need a GA, but it's a surgical procedure, so it has some of the benefits of surgery. Um, medical and conservative are the other two options, so we've talked a little bit about conservative. Um, effectively, medical ma management, surgical and conservative have very similar risks of um, infection um, and bleeding. Conservative has a slight, slightly higher risk of heavy bleeding and um, infection than medical or surgical, um, but they're cheaper and they're much less invasive and you're much less likely to get a uterine perforation with medical or conservative management. So you don't have zero risk of uterine perforation because around 30% of women having medical management or conservative management will fail to pass the pregnancy. And so those women will go on to have an evacuation. Um, but it means that 70% will pass the pregnancy tissue without having their uterus instrumented. 
Um, this is just a little picture for anyone who hasn't ever been um, at an ERPOC. Sorry, they're not very nice um, photos, uh, but um, this is the uterine, this is the speculum, which is what um, most people who are on this webinar will use in routine practice. Um, if you're a nurse practitioner or a smear taker, you put a speculum in the vagina for taking smears. Um, similarly for GPs, um, smear taking or STI swabs. So we put the speculum in, we gently grasp the anterior lip of the cervix with a valsellum, which is a horrible little toothed instrument. Um, and we use that to put some traction on the cervix to straighten the cervical canal. And then we introduce a suction curette, um, which actually the ones that we use are usually flexible and they're white plastic, so they don't quite look like this, but we actually just suck all the pregnancy tissue through a suction machine. Um, and then we'll often do a gentle sharp curette just to make sure that the cavity is empty. So pregnancy of unknown location is the bugbear. So now that women can know that they're pregnant within five minutes of intercourse um, and well before you can see the pregnancy on scan, this um, provides a completely new diagnostic category that's a bit of a headache for um, all of us because uh, it's a little bit worrying. And the reason I don't like it is because it's basically pathologizing totally normal pregnancy. If you get someone who's super anxious or they've been trying to conceive for ages and they've peed on a stick 10 days post ovulation and had a positive test and then they get a little bit of spotting which is probably their implantation bleed which is normal and a little bit of pain um, it's very difficult to reassure yourself or them that they don't have an ectopic pregnancy but until the hcg is over 1500 international units you cannot see a sac in the uterus on scan usually so um, you can see an ectopic sometimes because in an ectopic pregnancy, sometimes the HCG will never get above 1500, okay? And so you can't say that you should never scan someone with an HCG of less than 1500. If they have an HCG that's lower than 1500, but a really good story for ectopic and they're sore and you're worried about them, then you still need to send them to hospital or to the early pregnancy clinic if they're stable. Um, but we might not scan them until it reaches 1500 if it's going up. Um, and um, we're not likely to get a yielded diagnostic scan until the HCG is 1500 or higher if it's an intrauterine pregnancy. Um, so pregnancy of unknown location is either someone who has symptoms that are consistent with ectopic, but the HCG is less than 1500 and we can't see an ectopic or an intrauterine pregnancy on scan or it's someone who's just done their pregnancy test and really wants a scan and someone um, out of compassion gives them a scan and it's too early to see the pregnancy because they're not pregnant enough. So um, this is really the only scenario where a serum HCG is necessary. So when we're watching the actual quantitative level of HCG to see when it hits the threshold that we should be able to see the pregnancy or watching it to see whether um, it's doubling normally and it looks more like an intrauterine than an ectopic. Um, and otherwise, you really just need to pee on the stick to see that it's an intrauterine pregnancy and wait until you're at least six, six and a half weeks post your um, LMP to get a scan as a dating scan. So I've just got a couple, I've, as I said, I'm not really gonna talk much about ectopic. If anyone has specific questions, they can ask them at the end. I'm happy to do them in the Q&A. Um, but I've just got a few pictures of some types of ectopic. So um, ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that implants outside the endometrial cavity of the uterus. And a tubal ectopic is by far the most common. Um, this is a picture of a tubal ectopic. And what I hope you can see here is this is the uterus and this is the endometrial cavity. The endometrium is slightly thickened, but not very markedly. And um, here adjacent, this is the ovary and this is called the ectopic triangle. So it's the area between the uterus and the ovary. And this is where ectopic pregnancies most commonly arise. And um, sometimes you can get a little collection of fluid in the cavity of the uterus, which is called a pseudosac. Um, and so that's why just seeing a sac without a yolk sac in it is not full confirmation of an intrauterine pregnancy. 
So the rarer types of things that we might encounter in early pregnancy clinic and early pregnancy problems would be a heterotopic pregnancy. And that's where you have a concurrent intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancy. They occur about one in 30,000 um, pregnancies. I've seen two in my lifetime, so they're not as uncommon as you might think, but they were in the UK where we had a much larger patient population. Um, with the heterotopic pregnancy, we would remove the ectopic pregnancy and leave the intrauterine. And the two that I've had contact with have both had successful ongoing intrauterine pregnancies, um, but that's not always the case. Um, you can have an abdominal pregnancy, which is where the um, trophoblast implants on any tissue that has a good enough blood supply to keep that placenta going through the pregnancy. And um, so typically that would be on the omentum or on the bowel. And so the trophoblast will invade into the blood supply. And um, you can grow a pregnancy anywhere that you get trophoblasts that can implant into a good blood supply. And then more unusual ectopics include an interstitial ectopic. And that's one that's in the interstitium, so the junction between the uterine cavity and the tube. So if my arm is the tube and my body is the cavity, it's up in the corner of the uterus. Um, they're dangerous because they're difficult to diagnose on scan because they're they are actually in the uterus. They're just not in the right part of the uterus, and that part of the uterus doesn't stretch the way the the, the body of the uterus stretches. It's it stretches intermittent intermediately between a uterine stretch, which can obviously fit a term pregnancy, and a tubal stretch, which will pop after about um, six to eight weeks of growth in a tube. Um, a corneal pregnancy is a pregnancy that's in um, a, the horn of a bicornual uterus. Scar ectopic is in a cesarean section scar or any uterine scar. Um, and a cervical ectopic is one that's in the uterine cervix. And the problem with any of these ectopic locations, unless it's abdominal, is that um, if a pregnancy is growing in the lumen of something that can't stretch to accommodate a term placenta and fetus, whatever lumen it's in will ultimately rupture and um, heavy bleeding will occur. Um, so this is a heterotopic. This is the intrauterine pregnancy. And this is the one that's in there. So you can just see an ovary up here. It's in that ectopic triangle. And there's a little bit of free fluid here. So you've got your viable intrauterine pregnancy. You can see it says positive fetal heart motion. And you've got your um, viable, a, 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 a live pregnancy in the tube. Um, that will need to be um, surgically removed to give the other pregnancy a chance of making it to term. And then this is a picture of a scar ectopic. So this is the uterus here. The bladder will be up here. And this is the cesarean section scar here. And that ectopic is growing in there. And some of those can actually um, be viable and reach term and they become placenta accretus. Um, so we've had a couple of cases in Dunedin where someone's had a scar ectopic, they've been advised to terminate the pregnancy, they've declined for personal reasons, and um, they've actually achieved a viable pregnancy with a placenta accreta. But that's obviously a pregnancy that can kill that woman at pretty much any stage of the pregnancy. Um, because if you have a, a scar ectopic that rup ruptures into the peritoneal cavity, especially once you get beyond the first trimester, the chances of that woman getting to medical care and to theater quickly enough to stop the bleeding are um, dicey. All right, so I've got a couple of cases. Uh, station, she was G4P3. I always say, beware the multiple miscarriage, right? These women will tolerate a lot of bleeding before they seek care. They've had a couple of kids. They've had Lockyer rubra. They've got people to look after. They don't want to bother you to death before they've sought care. So this one was in the UK. It was when I was an SHO and she was using her toddler's nappy to catch the bleeding. And by the time she came to us in the acute gynecology unit, she had a hemoglobin of 55. She was pale, hypotensive and tachycardic. All right. Um, and uh, she had an emergency evacuation. Everything went well. She had a two unit blood transfusion and she did fine. But um, when you have bled out half of your blood volume, there's not a lot to spare before you would be getting into the cardiac arrest zone. Um, so these women need urgent transfer. I actually had a, a nulliparous woman transferred from Queenstown very recently um, with 
she had lost 1.4 liters of blood before she got to us in Southland by helicopter. And we called the theater team and in the middle of the night, the evacuation was very straightforward, but for some reason she just had really heavy bleeding. Um, she had normal pregnancy tissue. It wasn't a molar pregnancy. I don't know why she bled so heavily, but the, the odd person can have really heavy bleeding with a miscarriage that can be life threatening. Um, and something else just to note, um, if you're in the community and someone presents with symptoms of miscarriage and they look awful, uh, and especially if they're bradycardic, please do a speculum examination straight away um, before you've done anything else pretty much. Because if you put the speculum in and there's a closed cervix or super heavy bleeding, you know they need to come to hospital and there might not be much you can do in the rooms. But if they've got the pregnancy sac sitting in the cervix, distending it, that can cause a profound vasovagal reaction, which is known as cervical shock. And just pulling that pregnancy tissue out with sponge forceps or whatever you have um, will um, stop that cervical shock, stop her bleeding. Um, and please don't hesitate to repeat speculum examinations. If you're waiting with the woman um, and she's got, she says she can feel heavier bleeding or she's been all right and she starts to feel awful because um, it's a really common thing to have happen um, for the pregnancy tissue to be sitting in the os and the woman feels terrible and it is actually possible to have um, vasovagal syncope or um, an arrest by just removing that tissue. Um, a note on time and I can see I'm running out of time. I think I talk too much. Um, we may not get through much of molar pregnancy. Well, you'll have to come again, guys. Um, but don't rush. The times I've made mistakes in early pregnancy care or when I've been in a rush, read the histology report, look at the scan images if you, if you get them, read the scan report. Don't focus on the diagnosis that you think exists and confirm it with the tests that you get. Look at the test results and read them properly. Um, I had a woman with that I saw in Culp Clinic, Colposcopy Clinic, a couple of weeks ago. I thought it looked like CIN3. I got the histology result back. It said CIN3. What I didn't read, because I thought, oh, yeah, CIN3, tick, needs a let's, was that she also had AIS, which is adenocarcinoma in situ, which needs a completely different treatment with a cone biopsy. Luckily, I'm very OCD. So I rechecked the result when I was um, prepping my theater list and caught the error, called the woman, apologized, and scheduled her for the correct operation. I would say nine times out of 10, when something bad happens and we go back and we read through all those case notes and we lay the story out consecutively, not in a rush, um, the answers to why something happened that was adverse are already there from the beginning. So try to take your time if you can. It can be really difficult um, to do that. We're always busy. We're always in a rush. Um, but the other thing is that sometimes for early pregnancy issues, sometimes time is a crucial part of the diagnosis. So we've had a few pretty upsetting cases where women have had an early scan that has shown a likely non-viable pregnancy, but it's too early to make that call. And they've been so distressed that they want immediate medical or surgical management for what they think is definitely a miscarriage. And we've actually had to refer them to the termination service because it's not within, we cannot offer them an evacuation until we've confirmed a miscarriage. And sometimes it's really difficult to communicate that to the woman, especially if um, she absolutely knows her LMP date and she's certain that there's something wrong. Um, so the diagnosis. Um, Follow-up is really important. You need to make sure that you have safe systems. We need to make sure that we have safe systems in the hospital. Please send any pregnancy tissue that you receive. If the woman brings it in in a little plastic bag with her, please send it for histology, just like you would a mole that you remove or um, you know anything that you do in clinic. Always send it because um, there is a risk of molar pregnancy with pregnancy loss, and it can only be diagnosed if you send histology. And the next point at which it can be diagnosed is when the woman has a cancer. So um, always send it and always counsel your women. If you're seeing them and you, they've got some bleeding and it's a threatened miscarriage and they're waiting to see us or they're waiting for their scan, that if they pass any tissue, you would like them to bring it to the clinic and you can send it off for them. And they can have it back. You just write on the form that they wish to have their pregnancy tissue back. They can still bury it. Um, or do whatever they need to do for, for themselves and their families. Um, but um, make sure that you get that.
photograph. And HCGs, um, basically once you have a pregnancy that you can see on scan, you don't need to do serum beta HCGs anymore. You follow the woman with serial ultrasound scans. Um, after a pregnancy loss, you don't need to do an HCG as long as you've had histology confirmed pregnancy tissue that's been removed from the uterus or the woman's past tissue and her pain and bleeding have settled. If you do need, for whatever reason, you didn't see the pregnancy tissue, she's not sure, she's had a problem before, need to do an HCG, then you can get them to do a urine um, HCG a couple of weeks after the miscarriage. So two to three weeks after a complete miscarriage, the serum HCG should be back down to less than two, okay? If you do it too soon, a few days after, it will still be elevated. It takes some time to wash out of the system. Um, and um, you can repeat ultrasound scans if you need to and evacuation if there's more than 15 to 25 millimeters of products. Right, and so you're never gonna find out about my acute gynecology patient unless you come to my next talk, which will be on molar pregnancy. <laughs> Thank you. I think you're cheating us. We've still got five minutes. Still got five <laughs> I thought I was supposed to, I, do you want, can I go through it? I thought I was meant go to leave time for questions. It's all good? Okay, no, all right. So uh, Wiz, I love case stories, okay? And especially when they're my silly um, mistakes. But so I was, at, I, the acute gynecology SHO, I had been dying to do ONG for my entire medical school career. I'd done it for about two weeks at this point in Newcastle. And I got an urgent phone call from the acute gynecology clinic nurse who had an 18 year old girl who was a visitor to the hospital. And she'd been visiting her granny upstairs who'd had surgery. And she was hysterical, crying in acute pain. She'd been trying to, for pregnancy for three years. Okay, this is an 18 year old girl. Um, she was 12 weeks pregnant, hadn't had a scan yet and had severe acute abdominal pain. I immediately thought she had an ectopic pregnancy. So did my initial assessment. Her heart rate was 100, so she was borderline tachycardic. Blood pressure 95 on 55. She had a rigid abdomen. She was a tiny slip of a girl, but wouldn't let me touch her. She was basically screaming in agony. Uh, I was hysterical, pretty much. She was hysterical. Um, I put in two lines. I thought, oh my gosh, this is a ruptured ectopic. Two lines, called my reg straight away, sent bloods for a full blood count, using these LFTs, um, CRP, and a cross match. And my registrar came and so did the consultant on call that day. And in, in the UK, we have subspecialists who really have not done any general ONG for a very long time. So the subspecialist urogynecology consultant came and she and the registrar scanned the patient together. And this is what they saw on scan. Okay, now I'm this junior SHO, I saw this scan, but had no idea of the significance of this ultrasound scan. Okay, so they wheeled her up from the acute gynecology room for a category one laparoscopic investigation. And while they were in theater, I got the hemoglobin results, which were that her hemoglobin was 120. And one of the other registrars said, oh, what was her HCG? And I hadn't done one. And so she said, oh, well, add one on, but next time do an HCG. And then the registrar came down from clinic. And this is what they'd seen at laparoscopy. So no ectopic a bulky uterus, about 15 weeks size, normal fallopian tubes, normal ovaries, no bleeding, nothing. And this woman had a molar pregnancy. And um, when we got her bloods back, her HCG was 231,000. They actually had to take her back to theater to do an evacuation because they hadn't consented her for that because it was one of those perfect storm situations where this was an 18 year old, who'd been trying to conceive for three years. She'd gone to visit her granny in hospital, so already stressful situation, gone to the toilet, seen a bit of blood, had some pain, and was hysterical and beside herself. I was a very junior SHO who made an immediate spot diagnosis that this was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And no one else that was more experienced often went, well, hang on a minute. Actually, what, what's, our, you know, what's the story? What's our evidence? Um, so I probably rang the reg and said, oh, I've got a, I think I've got a ruptured ectopic. And from then on, that's what she had until we found out that she didn't. Um, so that kind of presentation for, an, for a molar pregnancy is so rare that this photo is from a, a BMJ case report for atypical presentation of common condition, okay? So it's actually super rare to diagnose a molar pregnancy in someone that's had an acute abdomen. And this was a a 33-year-old woman, 
um, in this BMJ case report who presented very similarly to my patient. So that made me feel a little bit better. And she was actually seen in ED by someone very experienced who also took her to theater. Um, so molar pregnancy, just briefly, used to be known as a hydatidiform mole. And um, hudatis is Greek for watery vesicle. It's now more commonly known as gestational trophoblastic disease. Its incidence is about one in 1500. Interestingly, in the UK, it's much more common, so one in 714, and heaps more common in Asian. Um, so that would be usually Southeast Asian, so Pakistani, Indian, um, Sri Lankan population in the UK. There's no difference in New Zealand ethnic groups. I don't think there are probably enough Southeast Asians in most of New Zealand to know what the um, rate is in New Zealand Asian population. We're interested in molar pregnancy because it's a special kind of miscarriage where you can have persistent abnormal trophoblastic tissue that can cause cancer. So the classical cl clinical presentation, again, from the books, from the olden days when we didn't have scans, was that you had a uterus that was large for dates, so the more than a month larger for gestational age. So like my girl, she had a 15 week size uterus um, when we did the laparoscopy and she was only 12 weeks pregnant. They tend to get um, hyperemesis gravidarum, right? Because they have these super high HCG levels. They used to get early onset preeclampsia, right? Which we never see like, so this is early onset as in prior to 20 weeks. And they had theca luteum cysts, which are these massive multi-cystic, tender um, ovarian cysts. And they also used to get clinical hyperthyroidism because um, as I'm sure many people know, HCG um, looks the same as TSH, so at a molecular level. Um, there are two types of molar pregnancy. There's complete molar pregnancy, which where um, all of the chromosomal material is from the father. So you either get um, two sperms fertilizing an empty ovum or um, duplication of one sperm with no maternal genetic material. And so they're 46XX, but they're P57 negative. So the lab will do some confirmatory testing to see whether it's a partial or a complete mole when you send the tissue. And um, the reason for that is that the complete molar pregnancies have a much higher chance of causing the uh, cancer or, or persistent gestational trophoblastic disease. And that's what a complete mole looks like. So it's this, um, these little grape-like vesicles. And now again, these are more commonly detected at a dating or a 12 week scan. The woman goes along for a scan to see the, the baby and sadly is told that there's no fetus and that there's um, this abnormal pregnancy. So partial mole, there can be a fetus present. It has a lower chance of turning into neoplasia. Um, and is, there's maternal uh, chromosomal material there. So it's triploid and is P57 positive. And I'm just telling you these things. It's not something that you're expected to know at primary care level, but um, this is how you may get, um, see a, a histology report from someone with a molar pregnancy. And um, these are the words. So usually they should say in the report, um, triploid P57 positive consistent with partial molar pregnancy. And the treatment is with surgical evacuation not medical management. Um, women who are, NTD, who are rhesus negative should be given NTD even though there's no fetus because that trophoblastic material can contain um, red blood cells that can be rhesus positive so they can sensitize the woman and everything that's removed must be sent for histology. Um, you can get gestational trophoblastic neoplasia after a normal pregnancy as well so um, occurring in a placental site tumor. This has a much higher mortality because as you can imagine, many women present with abnormal bleeding following a normal pregnancy and to have a sufficient index of suspicion that there could be something really seriously wrong takes a long time. And so often these women have significant disease with metastases prior to diagnosis. But the take home message from this is that if you get any woman who's recently been pregnant, had an abortion, had a miscarriage, had a baby, and they come in with abnormal vaginal bleeding, please do an HCG on them. It can be a urine HCG, but if that HCG is unexpectedly positive, they need further um, investigation. And last thing I'm going to say is just that um, there are excellent guidelines available online. Um, they were published in 2018. Um, they're not that long and they're pretty, pretty good. This is um, what they look like. Um, so that's it. Right now we really are out of time. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. You couldn't leave us hanging like that. That would be very unfair of you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, look, people are coming on already and they're just saying, you know, thank you very much for your time. Really enjoyed your presentation. Very informative. I think everyone will have taken away something new tonight and a yeah, good spread across New Zealand from people from all sorts of different professions. And yeah, just your enthusiasm is just beautiful to see. Thank you very much, Kate, this evening. Thank you. Fantastic.